So uh, I was told to somehow share a bit of what I do outside of the project here and uh, some of the things that I'm involved with now. So uh, I'm just going to be a short talk that I'm kind of improvising through and um, I'm going to tell you who I am and uh, for those who we haven't met yet. Uh, and, um, and then I'm going to show a few historical projects and talk about what I was doing before. Um, and uh, then I'll show a project which I just completed on Sunday, which just ended on Sunday, so that I was very busy with for the last months in Berlin. Um, and then I just say a few words about what we're trying to do in the workshop. Uh -huh, there's somebody up there. So, um, yeah, my name is Arnold Dreiblatt. I was born in New York, just to tell you a little bit, bit about myself. Um, and I've been, uh, let's see, I studied um, uh, both music, experimental music, and also um, I, uh, sort of my roots are in experimental film and early video art in the 1970s. I mean, I'm old. <laughs> Maybe I'm the oldest person here. And at the moment, anyway. Uh, and um, that led to the fact that I have kind of different areas that I've worked in over the years. Um, I also have another identity as a composer and musician uh, uh, over many, many years, back to the 1970s. Uh, I've worked in uh, film and uh, then with early video art. Now it doesn't really exist anymore. Now in Europe they say film for everything. And, um, and performance, uh, in the 90s I worked a bit in uh, state theaters in, in, in Germany and in Europe. Uh, um, and various kinds of performances, uh, performance works, and um, and installations. So I came to Europe, or I came to Berlin in the early 1980s. So I've been in Berlin a long time and in Germany a long time. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm going to show a little bit of some of the. Uh, so I just prepared a few like pictures on a. PowerPoint just to have some backup here and let's see if it works. Yes, yeah, so um, uh, I've been working for many years going back to the 19, uh, uh, early 1990s, actually late 1980s, uh, looking at how cultures and uh, societies store their memories, so a question of memory and uh, how um, uh, you know, so textual storage functions, institutional storage, and the institution of the archive uh, as a political category, um, uh, and what the whole the process of archiving entails. I, um, as opposed to some other artists who are also working with a kind of metaphorical nature of the archive, it's also become a kind of art historical terminology. I'm actually was from the beginning interested in the actual institutions and how they function. So um, I began, uh, this is an older installation, which is, uh, was at the Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin uh, in the 1990s, um, uh, utilizing archival texts uh, here in English from uh, a collection of biographies from Eastern and Central Europe from 1933, um, uh, which was called the Recollection Mechanism. And I, I worked um, early on with a sort of an interest in visualizing the archive or vocalizing the archive. So um, sort of like imagining a three-dimensional space that you could kind of enter into a, a sort of a, a three-dimensional textual space. Uh, this is one of the works that represents that. These were, um, and I, I still have some installations, one which is running in Berlin at this time, uh, where various kinds of data, uh, textual data from uh, different archival sources are um, uh, chosen through computer software and um, according to various uh, uh, decision making, digital decision making are then displayed. Uh, uh, and so these projects are live, they're not recorded. So the computer is making the decisions live. But then at the same time I began developing strategies for vocalizing the archive going back to the 1990s uh, in projects that were called um, uh, memory arena and uh, 
the memory project, uh, reading room various in various countries, uh, and the the idea was to gather, um, yeah, so hundreds of people from a, a city. They were often very so city based, and to they were invited to in a, to a simultaneous reading of text from the archive. And I would usually build an archival structure and collect the text and kind of spread them out. Uh, into archive boxes and folders, uh, uh, sort of simulating or playing archive also as a kind of game. And, uh, and then for the public, they could see this transformation, transformation or the movement and circulation of you know, file folders from boxes that are all categorized being brought into another space, which I usually call the arena. And, and there they would be read according to a certain time uh, uh, scores, so almost like a musical score. So at a certain time, uh, a particular person, pre-invited person, would meet a uh, predetermined archival file at a particular reading table at a certain time, and therefore it was had a kind of a ritualistic aspect. So I was developing these projects in the 1990s, and this is actually a recent one. I had kind of stopped for a while, which was realized in 1918 in Switzerland. Uh, actually, which was interestingly um, uh, one of the first projects I've done with, in a very small, almost a village, uh, which dealt with, instead of a, a larger cultural or city-based or nationally-based archival storage, but with a village storage. Yeah? So it was, they called it a small city, but it was actually a village uh, in the, the southern Alps of Switzerland. So. Um, yeah, and then I've also done some other projects. This is also a recent project which just opened. Uh, uh, what year are we in? 2021. Yes, in this year, a memorial to the um, to the book burning in Munich in 1933, uh, which is a huge spiral. Uh, um, I don't normally work in stone, but uh, uh, that was the prerequisite that it had to be sort of. Uh, everlasting and um, it's a spiral of book titles without any of actually the last book titles that were forbidden uh, um, up to the book burning and uh, uh, which took place all over Germany and uh, these titles are presented in a spiral without any punctuation that means without any separation so it becomes one huge title which is uh, the 340 titles end up as one very long title, which is uh, almost 10,000 letters, uh, was very difficult. It took four years. Then I've had some other projects, uh, developments, this in Berlin, an installation looking at the brain. And um, I was uh, privileged to have had uh, a residency at uh, MIT in the States and uh, working with uh, some scientists dealing with cognitive, uh, uh, the Department of Cognitive Sciences and looking at um, uh, some of the, the, the actually the what's called the resting state in the brain, which is the the state of the waiting room. You know that state where you're kind of waiting for something to happen, where there's very little input, and so it's actually interesting because um, I think it's interesting for artists. So this to think about this state, um, and until the 1990s, uh, they thought that. Um, you know, when we're bored, you know, when we're kind of daydream, is kind of the daydreaming state, um, that there's no input, yeah, that, uh, or there's, and there's very little, where there's no input, there's very little activity in the brain, but then, you know, now they have all this measuring equipment, so they found out that it's actually very busy, so, um, and so I work with texts of people who are trying to recall what, what they were thinking about, actually, the, the, the way that they do that is they wake you up from daydreaming. Actually, they found out something very interesting, so I just give this information that um, that actually in this state uh, uh, the brain is functions in a kind of a pendulum of 40, well, 45 to 70 second periods. Yeah, and, and it goes back and forth to a period where you're kind of down under and you're, uh, you know, like memories are coming from the past and then you're kind of speculating and strategizing for about the future, like I have to meet this guy next week and we'll probably talk about this and this. And then if you're not woken up by a car horn or a bell, then 
just naturally in this cycle you'll be woke, woken up and you'll realize I'm still waiting in this room and they haven't called me yet to the doctor and actually okay. anyway so I did this installation about this and I did a lot of research so and that was actually a project which involved music also where I did a sound score which I don't always do and also involving text where I work very much with text okay uh, now the project that I've been involved with very intensely for the last year or even more than a year um, uh, this is something that just um, just closed in uh, it was a performative a performative exhibition and I was asked to uh, create a, um, uh, a proposal for an exhibition working with the archive of the Academy der Kunste. The Academy der Kunste, Academy of Art, is kind of an elite. Uh, um, it's actually the descendant of the Royal Prussian Academy of the Arts. And uh, so there are different members, and they have an enormous archive going back to 1696, uh, which includes paper archives and documents, but also um, artworks and uh, all kinds of paraphernalia that has to do with artists in all fields from literature to you know performance arts to um, visual arts to theater etc cetera, etc cetera. and um, so I spent a half a year selecting works from this okay actually before I even say that um, I did my proposal was to base this project on an idea from John Cage, uh, the composer who worked a lot with um, uh, um, indeterminacy or chance operations. He often, he composed music, I don't know to what degree, some of you know who he was, maybe, maybe not everyone. Uh, he's known for working with um, chance in composing and structuring events. And um, uh, one of his last works was for, even though he was a composer, was for the a visual arts museum and uh, he imagined a work which is called Roly Holy Over uh, which was realized after his death um, it's a term from James Joyce and uh, um, he wanted to select uh, or he wanted that museums around the world would choose works from their collections without involving him and they would send them to a museum in LA you know and when they arrived they would be shown in an exhibition but the exhibition would be rehung every day so that any visitor would only see one version of the exhibition and if you came another day you would see a different exhibition uh, and in the space was a kind of a uh, res what he called a reservoir where all the works would be st uh, stored and then every day they would go and take them and hang them or put them out in the room so this was realized uh, not quite to that degree so from different museums in southern california so i decided to take the idea I gave it a project another name because I didn't want to be limited by his rules and uh, so it was kind of uh, in his spirit and um, I translated these the idea of these different museums to the different parts of the archive the different sections of the archive literature and dance and and visual arts and so forth and um, it's also it's yeah as I said it's one of the largest art uh, archives in Europe and uh, it's in many buildings all over Berlin. It's very, nobody really know, you know, knows about it. When they think of the Academy, they think of performances and so forth and exhibitions, but it's not so well known. And so I spent a half a year you know, buried in this archive and I would go there and tell the archivist that uh, you can now show something which has never been shown because normally they only show things which have a context. You know, There's an exhibition about something and then they look for the works that fit in the theme of the exhibition, but here they could show things that have never been shown, and also I asked them to look for strange objects and, and things like this. So we developed uh, a space, and in fact, then it was the problem how to do this. So I, I selected, uh, or they gave me a limit of 50 objects, uh, or 50 things, and uh, I managed to push it to about 80, and uh, I had a lot of fun searching for all of them. I found all kinds of funny things and interesting things and, uh, and many things which had never been shown. And um, uh, then was the problem how to do this. So they restricted me and they said, you can only change it every few days. So I, I figured out some mathematical pattern of every first day, every second day, every third day, every fourth day. Um, but then it would, it would start again. And uh, so there was never more than four days in between 
of any exhibition and then was physically how to do it so the wall we spent a week before the uh, whole week before the show opened and we put we ran the whole schedule through so i had made scores for each change each exhibition what's going to be shown where and then we had to put the nails and screws in on the wall for the entire three months uh, and then we developed these kind of vitrine cabinets which can be moved around on wheels and we had this you see there's a there's a monitor in this space to show media we also showed media and this room down at the end uh, I'm not sure I thought I had a picture of it yeah here is the is the storage area for all the works and so the visitors come in and they can see this whole interchange and of, of, of things going on so a whole team has to come of uh, archivists and people working and the registrars and all these people to register that something is being taken out uh, it's a kind of a theatrical moment and that happens during the exhibition so it could be you see a moment of the exhibition which was not there yesterday or it could be that you actually see them take one down and start another one so these are pictures from it it was also all the changes were documented on a kind of surveillance video here and it was a little kind of uh, information area about the history of this piece that John Cage developed. So here you can see that. And yeah, this is what it looked like inside the storage area. And um, yeah, actually this is one of my favorites. It's I asked them to give me a painting that was damaged. And uh, they gave me this painting which has a hole in it. Uh, uh, it's not so easy to see the hole. It's, it looks, the hole really appears much stronger when it's against a white wall. So I'm always admiring the whole. I never really care about the painting. It's a like un, uninteresting academic painting from the 19th century. Uh, it's also damaged in other ways, but the whole is the most interesting part. This is a, in front of it is a uh, clothing stand from a, um, from a Brecht performance in 1954. Um, this is one of my favorite objects, just as an example. This is a tablecloth which was found, was shown to me in the architecture collection. And uh, there's some, some people were drawing on it, some sketches. Is, okay, we're in architecture situation, a lot of architects here. So I think it was a situation with a couple of architects sitting around with some beers, maybe in a restaurant or something, drawing sketches. And there's some reference to Alma Alto and there's the word Hamburg, and there's some very complex so buildings being drawn on this thing. And uh, so what's interesting about it is that the archive doesn't know who the architects were. They don't know when it was, where it was, and they don't know why it's in the archive. So this is a good example of the kind of things I was looking for. Uh, yeah, so I also sometimes put objects, and this is like this hat stand, uh, the clothing stand in front of... Uh, of a Namjoon Pike video, uh, and uh, uh, this is a, uh, a film case from, uh, from a filmmaker, uh, and these are pictures from a theater, people that worked in a theater in the 1950s in East Germany, um, so anyway. Uh, okay, and then there was a, though there's no names for the work, so normally you come into a museum, you look under what it is, so, um, and that also, Cage also didn't have any names, he didn't have any names at all. But I, um, uh, this is called in German a Finn book. It's like a finding aid book, which is typical in archives, you know, for looking at different collections or also in art collections. And so we just printed all of the, in English and German, all of the information about each item uh, and gave it a number with, with the archival number and we gave it, a, assigned it a number in our project. And then under the works on the walls or in the vitrines, you could... Um, you had the number and you could actually do the research yourself and find out what it is. So, and then actually on the side here are these scores that I made and drawings about what's going to be shown and uh, actually if you go back here, I don't know where that was here, like somewhere, okay, I'm sorry, all the way back. Yeah, here you see on the right, yes, yeah, so on the right is the actual, like, the daily uh, score or drawing of the things which are being shown at that time. So. And, um, okay, so, yeah, and actually we had to, uh, we had the coordinates on the floor so that they could figure out where the things go. Um, it worked fairly well. 
I had the only person who actually saw all the exhibitions was the photographer that I sent to document all of them. So there was, he had to go and he came every time, he had the whole schedule and went in, so he's the only one that saw it all because of course I was traveling and you know I would come back to Berlin and go see what was there, but so, and I haven't gotten the photos yet. So now um, I'm coming to kind of what we, are something that's related to what we're doing here, so um, uh, I propose to work on two utopian uh, educational projects or sites of experimental education, one which was realized and one which was never realized. And the one which was realized um, is uh, Black Mountain College in the United States. Um, so I've been speaking to my participants in, in my group today about it and uh, I was involved in a project in Berlin, in the Hamburger Bahnhof, which also Raum Labor did the design, the art, um, exhibition design for in, what year was that, 2015 or 16, um, and I was in, uh, which was a historical exhibition about this very exemplary and interesting history, um, uh, and I was invited to do a performative project in a, a little bit based on, am I talking too long? Or it's okay? Okay. Uh, I'm listening to myself suddenly, uh, and um, and I um, so I developed a performative uh, uh, project where students from 11 different academies, ranging from theater to dance to visual arts, et cetera, et cetera, um, and uh, uh, were in residence in the exhibition and had access to an archive that I had developed and had um, from research uh, in the states about this school. Um, which has, uh, in which many famous people uh, 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 taught and uh, uh, which has its origins in a transfer of knowledge uh, from the Bauhaus and from Berlin to, uh, to the States and which then I believe came to New York and uh, has something to do with my history. Um, so I was very much uh, uh, glad to do that and I used some of the strategies I developed for these reading projects earlier here so that the participants at certain times in the day would take files out and either read them or perform them or do some kind of action within the exhibition, also many at the same time. So I have brought with me some of these files that I developed so uh, and we're now set up up there and there's some very interesting thing that happened today that um, I thought of this when I saw this space but uh, it's interesting that um, the um, members of the group actually discovered in one in the documentation that I found uh, that actually one of the buildings that they that they built the students and faculty built in the uh, 1940s at Black Mountain used the same material and had an opening just like this, uh, except in that case the, the um, I don't know what you call it, the window cover went up instead of going down and so protecting against sunlight. Uh, but very, very similar and actually the poster for the exhibition back then showed a woman just behind this opening that looks just exactly like this, so that's interesting. So we're developing that uh, and and also I should say there's some interesting ideas came from the group that's being developed about you know in talking about what is an archive uh, and and that process to think about what we would want to uh, want to save or preserve from this event which is you know ephemeral and it's going to disappear and okay there's documentation but maybe there can be some other kind of materials that could be preserved from this period for 2029. So just to connect it to another, <laughs> to give you a little intro, you know, get you ready, uh, get you hot there, ready to go. Uh, but I'm not done yet. So, uh, uh, and then there's another contrasting project, um, which I'm not exactly sure how we're gonna, I mean, I would uh, uh, deal with here. Um, which is a project which didn't actually take place, but which was discussed uh, for many years. Um, this is the Free International University, uh, which existed as a kind of, I don't know, I call it an art idea, uh, it's a conceptual idea. Um, but in fact, there was um, 
there was an attempt to actually make it happen, and there was an association, a Verein, in Dusseldorf uh, with Josef Beuys and uh, many other uh, people who were involved in the Hochschule here, but not only, also um, from Cologne and others involved in the Green Party and different uh, international guests uh, that they were connected to, also through uh, political action. So for instance, Rudy Tuchka was involved. Uh, uh, and they met, okay, this is the incredible thing. I didn't actually realize that it was so long until I w got into a conversation with Yuta. Where is Yuta? Is she here? No. Uh, just before. Um, and uh, I realized that actually they were talking about this from 1973 to 1978 at least, because I, those are the files I have. I, I got them from Klaus Steck, and they've never been published. So. These are meetings that happened here in Dusseldorf, and I transformed them into a, um, a kind of reenactment situation. I did this in this, this is this picture in a, an exhibition um, about uh, or concerning the work of the Fluxus artist Robert Filou in, uh, uh, in Bern, in the uh, Kunstmuseum Bern. Uh, and then I printed, you see this wall, floor of posters, hundreds of posters. Um, uh, with texts out from these uh, meetings, uh, some from boys, some from other figures, which are incredibly uh, contemporary. So they, many of them are very relevant to our situation today. And yeah, so that actually this reenactment took place on these posters and at the end of the event, people could just take them. And uh, and then, um, yeah, and so this is what it kind of, the setting, this is actually a rehearsal, six speakers and uh, one um, male. Okay, and the, other, the main thing is that we, um, at the time, there was a meeting of the International Kunstler Gremium, uh, which is uh, IKG, which is a, um, an art organization, it's not so well known in Germany, uh, but which was actually founded by Boys and Klaus Steck and these people, or part, they were involved in the founding, and it so happened that there was a meeting uh, uh, of this group at the same time in this exhibition as I was there. So I asked the female artists of this group, some of the female artists, artists to take place in this reading and this reenactment. And in fact, some of them were from Dusseldorf and actually knew these people, you know, many of whom were just names to me. So, uh, and uh, this is something which we could do. Uh, and... Um, of course, it's in German, so it's you know, more interesting for the German speakers, but it might be interesting to make it public. Uh, and we just met a politician, a woman here tonight, who was, who was going to the theater, and she was interested to take part. And we don't know when we're going to do this or how we're going to do it, but we're thinking about it. And uh, this is some, there was a poster action also here. Uh, they were redone because the kind of paper that we wanted to use, it, this kind of bright colors, day glow papers we couldn't use because it's outside, so we redid them with 500 different um, uh, uh, different uh, colors, combinations. Actually, where are these posters? Where are the extra ones? We only put up 300, and there should be another 200, right? What? Where? Where, where are they? <laughs> you! <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, I meant you. <laughs> yeah, so somewhere are these posters, we can start hanging them up. Okay, well, so that's something that I forgot, but uh, they are actually kept for this moment. Okay, so that's it. Yeah, so um, uh, I'm sorry if I talk too long, but uh, um, I'll pass the uh, microphone over to uh, the next group, which is uh, has been waiting anxiously to... <laughs> to take part and do you have to do some technical changes here change computers a bit, yes. yes a little bit okay so okay thank you okay.